Boa tarde. Lembrando-os a todos que hoje à noite será realizado no pátio do colégio, local onde foi fundada a cidade de São Paulo, o jantar do presidente. Para iniciarmos as atividades dessa tarde, convido ao palco a Agatha Dush, da Universidade Católica do Lille, para um anúncio. Agathe Doucher, chargée d'études et sociologue au CREGE, qui est un centre d'études et de recherche de l'Université catholique de Lille. Nous menons actuellement une étude sur l'inclusion des étudiants en situation de handicap dans les universités catholiques dans le monde entier. Donc, cette étude a pour objectif de recenser les bonnes pratiques des universités catholiques dans le monde, de faire partager ces bonnes pratiques, de voir aussi quelles sont les difficultés. Donc euh, je pense que l'Assemblée Générale est une euh, très bonne opportunité pour, euh, pour échanger sur ce thème avec chacune des universités. Euh, pour cela, je tiens un stand au niveau de l'entrée du centre universitaire. J'ai un petit stand qui euh, explique brièvement euh, l'étude, donc euh, j'attends votre euh, venue pour euh, pouvoir euh, en discuter. Voilà. Merci. Daremos início a essa tarde com a palestra Liderar as Universidades Católicas no Século XXI. Que programa? Para isso, convidamos à mesa, para presidir a sessão, o magnífico reitor Jorge Baeza, da Universidade Católica, Cardenal Raul Silva Henriquez, do Chile. Buenas tardes. Durante estos días hemos hablado de nuevos contextos, de nuevos estudiantes, de nuevos profesores. Todo ello también exige de una nueva agenda en el liderazgo de conducción de las universidades. Quienes tenemos las tareas de conducir universidades, nos hemos enfrentado a diario la tarea de lograr un cuidadoso equilibrio entre calidad, identidad y viabilidad. Cada vez son más exigencias de calidad que vienen determinadas de procesos externos de acreditación, de ranking internacionales. Por otro lado, la tarea de mantener la identidad católica de nuestras universidades siempre es un desafío que cada día nos enfrenta nuevos retos. Pero todo ello no basta. Se suma a lo anterior la tarea de hacer viable financieramente la universidad, gestionarla no solo para que sobreviva, sino que crezca en un mundo donde la competencia y los costos cada vez son mayores. Si logramos calidad e identidad, pero sin viabilidad, habríamos un trabajo de restores irresponsables. Si nuestra preocupación es la calidad y la viabilidad y descuidamos la identidad, estaríamos traicionando nuestros principios. Si lo que nos concentra es la identidad y la viabilidad, pero sin calidad, estaríamos gestionando una pobre universidad que no es lo mismo que una universidad para los pobres. ¿Cómo liderar hoy la universidad? Para reflexionar sobre esta materia, tenemos la alegría de poder presentar al profesor David Luch, que es director del proyecto internacional de la Fundación de Liderazgo para la Enseñanza Superior del Reino Unido, 
La Fundación de Liderazgo para la Enseñanza Superior es una organización creada en Londres en el 2004 que proporciona apoyo y asesoría para el liderazgo, gobernanza y dirección de la enseñanza superior. El profesor invitado es un director de proyectos internacionales, ha sido responsable de proyectos en 24 países diferentes en una amplia gama y diversa de universidades. Hasta octubre del 2007 fue el presidente de la Universidad Británica de Dubái, donde le correspondió su estructuración y su desarrollo desde su creación. Entre el 2006 y el 2009, integró la Comisión Consultiva Internacional para el Aprendizaje y el Liderazgo de la Asociación de Oriente Medio. Antes de estar en Dubái, por un tiempo de 14 años, fue secretario en dos universidades con secretario general en dos universidades británicas. El profesor David Luke, ex integrante del grupo académico del programa que está desarrollando la FIU, liderar una universidad católica en el siglo XXI. Bienvenido, profesor. Mr. Chairman, colleagues, the theme of this conference is teaching and learning in a Catholic university, education and training. This session looks at the teaching and learning of its rectors and its leaders and will do so paying attention to the three main strands of Catholic universities, teaching, research, and service. The slides that will appear before you will be available afterwards. And as are always, I have designed these uh, to be a resource, drawing on the experience of the IFCU program the Leadership Foundation, and my personal professional uh, experience in the field. What I'm proposing to do after some brief introductions is to remind us of the nature and characteristics of Catholic universities, look at the big issues that are facing them, and then turn the focus to their implication for leaders. We will look at key aspects of leading Catholic universities, and then how we can best prepare and support people who are doing that. I will conclude by mentioning the pilot program, which I have the privilege to be a part of the leadership team of. That leadership team is under the direction of Professor John Davis, and my colleagues on the team are Robin Smith and Neil Sparman. But as well as them, it is the participants on the program who have been a huge source of inspiration for me and for this presentation and only just before this meeting we were gathered and they were reporting on some of the initiatives which they have been able to take following the program uh, which I found to be greatly impressive. Let us remind ourselves of the nature and characteristics of Catholic higher education bodies. Not an easy group to work with, partly because of their huge diversity. And that diversity comes in 
as many dimensions as you can think of. Size, differences in their foundation, variations in their missions, and so on. And if that is not sufficient, um, if that is not sufficient, there are the challenges that they experience from secular and sometimes non-supportive societies. Ambiguous relations with state agencies in terms of how they fit into the structure, how they are accredited, how they are recognized, and how they are quality assured add to the complexity of the leader's role. Some of them are buoyant in student numbers. Others are not. And there are particular challenges regarding clerical or related professions. That leads to, in some cases, financial vulnerability and sustainability issues, in part brought about by limited critical mass. At the same time, managing the steady state is not an option. There are pressures to consider options to extend and diversify the student population and the academic offering. And we heard this morning of the sort of challenges that can come from IT and broader access to very cost-effective material on the World Wide Web. And within their countries, Catholic universities are facing much more competition. Continuing, looking now at two internal factors, relative to some sectors of higher education, there is an absence of the tradition of professionalized leadership in the management and the administration, although that let me say that that varies hugely between different countries. And also, organizational cultures which are relatively weak on strategic approaches are inward-looking rather than outward-looking. And then, penultimately, a host of societal challenges relating to the loss of a spiritual ethos in business and government, social deprivation, demand for high quality education for which a positive contribution is required. And then, if all of that is not sufficiently challenging, there are additional difficulties when significant amounts of grant aid are not necessarily systematically managed. This, I think, leads to the following big issues facing Catholic universities. At one level, the Catholic universities have a huge opportunity. They are, without doubt, the biggest global network of universities in the world. That provides immense opportunities, but those institutions, as well as thinking globally, must also act locally so that the benefits of globalization can be felt locally. That has to be achieved uh, giving impact from a faith-based institution. And some of those institutions contain students who, because of national regulations, are predominantly secular or even predominantly of other faiths. There is a whole spectrum of developing to developed countries in which Catholic universities operate, and each of those present different challenges for the leaders. 
fundamental to the integrity of Catholic universities. Their leaders have to consider diversification and responding to social issues and doing so in a way that achieves financial responsibility. They need to deliver benefit both to the Catholic Church and through its service mission to the world. They have to cope with the diversification of clientele and programs and the implications of that for the core activity. And of course, to think through Sapienta Christiana and Ex Corde in the contemporary world. And as was mentioned yesterday, quality assurance is vital. Now, taking that fundamentally impossible agenda, what are the activities that most of all require attention? Well, I would suggest that the relations with states and with state agencies, particularly regarding licensing and accreditation to assure the validity and the quality of the degrees that are being issued are important. And without achieving financial sustainability, universities are not going to be able to go on to deliver their mission. Maintaining or increasing student enrollments is another big challenge. And that requires the university to be agile, responsive, to embrace modern technologies and so on. And then the response to societal challenges, the loss of a spiritual ethos in business and government. And that is not just something that is happening in developing countries. In the city of London, where I live and work, there is a very high level group chaired by a former sheriff of the city working with the Archbishop of Canterbury, looking at this very subject. And my own involvement is with school children and helping them to debate some of the issues. And then, of course, social deprivation and underprivilege and the issues that that gives. Responding to competition from state and private universities and increasingly in a globalized world, competition from other countries. And a significant help to all of this would be the introduction of some kind of disciplined strategic planning to make sure that the resources available to the universities now and in the future are used most effectively. Just going back one point, I had the opportunity to do a study for the European Union in some developing countries in North Africa. There was previously a perception that private universities were not perhaps as substantial or capable of delivering the quality that state universities or universities such as Catholic universities were capable of. It was actually the private universities in the countries surveyed that were making the running, both in terms of the quality and the relevance of what they were offered, with parents prepared to pay quite high premiums to get that sort of education. And that is part of the competitive challenge which your leaders face. So what now are the implications of this for our leaders? Well, we'll just quickly have a look at the purpose of leadership. The groups that should be considered as part of leadership, we'll look at some dimensions of that, behaviors, credibility, and the challenge that we face. 
Now, many millions of words, if not books, have been written about leadership. Many of them try to make leadership very complicated. I want to try and make it more accessible. Now, this picture is a real picture, and it was sent to me by a missionary friend from Africa. And if it's not quite clear on the screen, what you see is a light aircraft and some lions enjoying the shade provided by the wing. Now, let me suggest to you that the essence of leadership is trying to get people from A to B having regard to the difficulties that lie between those two points. And if you remember anything from this talk, please remember this image. To think of leadership as just being the responsibility of the rector would be to miss the point. Our university chancellors, the members of the governing body, the deputies to the rectors, the deans and the heads of departments, all would benefit from leadership development. We worked with Pakistan, which wanted us to invest in the development of their rectors. The programs were seemingly going well until a ministry official reported that they were causing great difficulty in the ministry because the ministry could not understand what these people were now trying to achieve and could we provide programs for the ministry officials. When we did, systems changed and the aspirations that the rectors had were capable of being delivered. My point is that all of those involved in leadership should be seen as the potential audience for leadership training. As I said, millions of books have been written about leadership. Let me keep it simple. These are some dimensions of leadership. Leaders are expected to be pretty good at seeing the big picture, but at the same time paying attention to detail. They need to encompass both leadership and management. They need to be capable of having visions and of implementing them, being creative and innovative. One of the ways of thinking about your own leadership and your own leadership development needs is, first of all, yourself, your own style, your strengths, your weaknesses. Then, your interaction with your team. How do you appoint that team? How do you work with that team? How do you motivate that team? And then thirdly, all of that is being conducted within your own organization, which will have its traditions, its values, its politics, all of which you, as a leader, will need to be aware of. And then, of course, the organization does not work in isolation. And the environment, which can include states, can include local stakeholders, industry, parents, and so on, needs to be understood. And if you hang on to those four elements of leadership, I find that a helpful way to look at it. Leadership obviously spans secular and sacred bodies. And the list at the bottom there was the list drawn up by Kimberly Clark, a consulting firm, which expected all of those things to be demonstrated by all of their staff. Visionary, inspirational, collaborative, innovative, decisive, and to build talent. We'll come on to succession management 
uh, in a bit, but um, those are quite important. And then, just finally, if you want to look at the Leadership Foundation website to get the millions of words down to hundreds of words, we commissioned a literature review by a chap called Bryman, and he identified core leadership behaviors, developing and communicating vision, setting direction, modeling values, inspiring colleagues and team members, motivating by challenging and supporting, promoting innovation, exercising judgment, being a pivotal agent of change, earning trust, something that is absolutely vital for a leader, and creating the freedom for others to lead. Now, let us start by looking at how we appoint our rectors. It's absolutely vital that they have academic credentials at a high level for their credibility. Within the Catholic Church, their religious background is important, and they must enjoy personal standing with the appointing bodies. But I wonder how many appointing boards look at previous experience of leadership or try to identify the leadership skills that their staff have. This you may regard as an op oversimplification, but I want to suggest to you that this is central to the task. The big task is to enable independently minded individuals to, who, who have advanced through their own scholarship and research in a single discipline to develop leadership skills which are fundamentally about motivating and enabling others. Enabling them to act together, which is contrary to how their earlier success might have been achieved. To set and achieve objectives across a range of disciplines for the benefit of the whole institution and their stakeholders. And to do that in the, in the context of a complex and a changing environment. Fundamentally, moving people from a narrow focus, which is about themselves and their own progression, to a much broader focus, which is about their institution and their place in the world. Now, the key aspects of leading Catholic universities effectively, I would suggest, are understanding and engaging with the external environment, understanding and engaging with the leadership of the institution, having the confidence in demonstrating modern leadership methods and skills, and having personal effectiveness. Now, although there are more words on that page, I want to suggest to you that that still comes down to understanding yourself, working with a team, understanding your organization, and the environment in which it works, and delivering that with confidence. Now, if one looks at the external part of that first, the principal challenge in the 21st century for Catholic universities is to seize the global opportunities and to deliver the benefit locally. There is a lot of talk about 
preparing global citizens. And for Catholic universities, with a vast fellowship of universities around the world, that should be easier than for secular universities that do not have that advantage. Also, there is the opportunity for collaboration on research and in sharing on those subjects related to the priesthood where you offer something that is unique. You really have the opportunity through your higher education network to see the Catholic Church as a worldwide, national, and locally relevant body. Although the requirements are different in different dimensions. The host country might be interested in you for the benefit that you can bring to the economy, the perpetuation of the culture, and for meeting aspects of the societal agenda. It might see your contribution to the key stakeholders, the wealth generators in your area. And obviously, you need to engage professionally with legal and regulatory requirements. And then your contribution to the higher education sector as a whole in that country. The influence that you will have on schools and not necessarily just on Catholic schools. And then the perpetuation of the culture in the region. Then, as a leader, engaging with your institution. Its traditions, cultures, and values are important. As a leader, or as leaders, we should respect them, but have the courage to reform them and to modernize where necessary. Looking at the vi vision, mission, and objectives of a university, are they still fit for purpose? The policies and procedures, are they still not just legally compliant, but are they effective? Are they meeting in a responsible and innovative way the high expectations of human resource management in a particular country? Is your governance structure clear, effective, and fit for purpose? Or do decisions of any import take ages to make because responsibility is passed from one place to another? And I'm going to jump to politics and power. To understand these is vital. An understanding of these can enable you as leaders to make change or it can disable you completely. And then, saving the most important until last, the students, the staff, and the stakeholders who make an institution and perpetuate its values. For modern leaders, there needs to be confidence in demonstrating modern leadership skills. On the current pilot program, we are majoring around strategic planning, which of course has as its component parts financial, human resource, academic, quality estates, and other component strategies. Implementing that plan requires the management of change, not easy. Performance monitoring, review, and the revision of plans, and ensuring that you have the secure support of external and internal stakeholders in delivering those plans. You may need to modernize the organization hugely difficult, and changes which make leadership a very lonely place. And in so doing, considering the risks 
of various actions. And risk is not something dreadful and negative, but risk is also letting go of opportunities that could be positive uh, for an institution. We don't have time to go today to go into the detail of strategic planning, sufficient to say that these are the key components and they are included in the presentation. Management skills. I've listed there a few that are essential. Teamwork, delegation, hugely important and very difficult. It can result in a loss of security, but also the liberation to see the big picture and to concentrate on the vision and delivery of uh, the vision for an institution. Quality assurance is vital. And communications in different ways with the different groups of stakeholders are often how leaders are judged. And then back to the self, your personal effectiveness as a leader with your integrity at the top of the list. Efficient use of your time, the ability to prioritize, those human skills, those occasions where people respect you because you were sensitive to their situation at a particular time. Emotional intelligence, the use of modern media, and so on. I've set out there just a few examples of what is effective behavior in terms of leadership and what is ineffective behavior. And under the effective list, clarity about what needs to be achieved, involving people, communicate a compelling view of the future. You are the leader. You need to encourage people to follow you. Agree clear responsibilities and objectives to deliver results. On the other side, the ineffective side, looking to others to provide direction. I'm not the leader, I'm just the facilitator. Taking an overly cautious approach. Losing sight of the big picture. How then can we, and the we here can be IFCU, it can be universities in a particular country, or it can be individual universities, how can we prepare and support university leaders? Well, the first way is to have some prior training in leadership skills. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be awfully happy about getting on an aircraft, an aircraft if I knew that the pilot had no previous experience in flying a plane. And for those who fear that too many cooks can spoil the broth, you may like to know that on each major cruise liner, there are at least two or three senior members of the staff who have their master's ticket. So in the event of the master falling ill or enjoying too much hospitality or whatever, there are at least two or three other people who are able to take command of that ship and ensure the safety of the passengers. Why should that not be so in higher education? So succession planning, I think, 
is vital. And I would start that as early as people who are training to be researchers. This September, for the first time, we will be receiving a group of leading students from Saudi Arabia in London. They are still undergraduates. But because they have expressed interest in a professional career in higher education, we have been asked to start the development of their leadership skills. We will be monitoring this uh, program very carefully because I think it is a wise decision by the university concerned. Of course, there are leadership programs that you can send people on. And some of those are very good and well targeted, um, some perhaps not so. For those who have leadership experience, they can share it by offering mentoring. And having identified previously that leadership is a lonely place to be, action learning or support groups of one kind or another can be very effective in helping our leaders to lead. But how do leaders learn? Most of them are very intelligent and very experienced and successful people. Well, we did some research on that, and we found that leaders learned most effectively from diagnosis and from analyzing experience from their own insights, sharing those, and receiving feedback on them. Focusing on applied leadership, training with a purpose. While leadership programs that are outward bound and have ping pong competitions can be hugely valuable uh, in helping people to improve their awareness, leadership programs with a purpose that can be applied back in the institution can return so much more to an institution. Leaders need to be challenged as well as supported. Specific insights can be valuable and IFCU provides a range of services and insights and this convention being one of them where leaders can be supported. Now finally, it has been my pleasure to be one of the leadership team of the pilot IFCU program for rectors. We have 15 rectors, each from a different country, who have four weeks of exposure with the leadership team but a whole lot of work to do before the program, between the modules, and after the program. And what we have heard this lunchtime is the huge impact that this program is already having in the institutions where rectors are participating. I am not going to go through this in detail the program aims are set out here on the uh, slide and you will notice that it is very much about leadership development for the individuals but with a practical purpose for their institutions. The philosophy and principles of the program are there, very firmly rooted in the Ro Roman Catholic tradition. The program is action-oriented, it's strategic, and it has a number of phases which involved prior work, um, development of projects during the course, and monitoring as we go through. And there you have details of the content. Now, I am not going to dwell on the comments of the participants. If they wish to, in the question session that follows, they would be most welcome to share their views. But generally, 
it would seem that the aims that we set out to achieve have been achieved, at least to date. And what is particularly pleasing is the very positive responses that we've had about the value of the programme helping each of the participants with their own action plans. I've put on that slide a selection of the actions that members of the programme said they were going to take when they left Bangkok in April. If I am ever asked to give a presentation like that again, or like this again, that will be updated to show what has actually been done. And that would include some very challenging change projects which are coming through very successfully. Now, as we draw to a close, let us try to summarize. From the research, from the program, what are the emerging features of a model for the Catholic University of the 21st century? Well, they need to be agile. They need to be responsive. They need to be adaptive. And they need to be entrepreneurial. We heard yesterday morning from this platform that Catholic universities should reinvent themselves. It is those features that will help them to do that. The internet provides us with a huge opportunity and a major threat. Having learnt what we learnt from the IFCU survey, what does that mean for the way that we teach students, or put better, the way in which we help them to learn? Are we using online learning sufficiently, powerfully, within our program. We will be looking at these features in the future model modules of the program. I mentioned earlier on that just to look at rectors alone was not sufficient. The members of governing bodies, the chancellors, they would benefit, I am sure, and I'm sure their rectors would agree, from some appreciation of modern leadership and how they, from their position in the structure, can enable their university and provide effective governance. Rectors would be greatly supported if their deputies and their deans all were proficient leaders or at least developing their leadership skills. This does not have to be done in expensive international leadership programs. Much can be done locally, much can be done in-house. Looking at the longer term, succession planning is something which could greatly enable universities. And so, to summarize, in my view, Catholic universities have huge opportunities. And their influence, in my view, is much needed in society. But they face substantial challenges in achieving that. Their success in achieving that will depend in no small part on the quality of their leadership. I applaud IFQ for its significant role in designing and facilitating this pilot program. I am delighted, especially having had the feedback this lunchtime, to see the benefits that are being gained from this first program for rectors. And I wish every success to IFQ and to the program in taking that work forward. Thank you very much.
Muchas gracias, profesor. Muchas gracias también por acortar su exposición con la intención de facilitar el, el diálogo. Tenemos una limitación que a las 15.30 nosotros debemos salir de acá porque tenemos una actividad externa. Entonces, la posibilidad de preguntas y de diálogo tiene esa limitación. Dejamos abierta entonces la posibilidad de consulta. Carlos. Es que, es que vos pouvez... Momento. Est-ce que vous pouvez approfondir un petit peu ce que la spécificité de la, de la leadership en tant que catholique, pas seulement des universités catholiques, mais de leader en tant qu'une personne catholique Merci. I think the significant difference between leading a Catholic university and leading a university which is not based in a particular faith is making sure that the basis of that faith defines not only what you do as a university, but the way in which you do it. Are you, as a leader, treating your staff in the way that you are expected to as a member of the Catholic faith? Is what you are doing based in Christ? And through that, even though many of your staff may not be Catholics. Your influence, your example, should rub off on them to the extent that they treat their students in the same sort of way and that those students then go out in the world with Christian, with Catholic, values which they put into place in the workplace, thereby enabling the mission of the church to go forward in the world. Gracias, profesor. Muy amable. Solari de Perú. Además, hay una diferencia notable. El planeamiento estratégico convencional contesta la pregunta, ¿dónde quiero estar? El planeamiento estratégico desde una mirada contemplativa de la realidad, que es lo que puede hacer una universidad católica, si es que lo quiere hacer, si lo quiere hacer, ¿no? si usa los instrumentos de lo que está revertido, va a contestar no a la respuesta a dónde quiero estar, sino a dónde estaré, que es totalmente distinto. ¿no? Eh, por esa razón es que no solamente es ejemplo con la conducta, hay ejemplos con la metodología de trabajo. Una universidad secular ve a los demás como sujetos de derechos, una universidad católica los ve como hermanos y hermanas. Es totalmente distinto la visión de la justicia basada en una filosofía de derechos de los otros, de una filosofía que considera fraternalmente a la realidad. Entonces nosotros tenemos muchos instrumentos que lamentablemente a la hora de la gestión, es tan grande los instrumentos de gestión pragmatista y secular, que una universidad católica puede terminar haciendo una gestión pragmatista y secular cuando está revestida 
de otras herramientas. Y no hay que tenerle miedo a la palabra, pues, sobrenaturales. ¿no? El cristianismo, la fe, son cuestiones sobrenaturales y ahí es donde nos movemos. Hay que recordárnoslos todo el tiempo para no salirse de esa visión. No se puede cambiar el mundo desde una visión cristiana si uno adopta una visión no cristiana. ¿no? Thank you for that comment. And perhaps I can respond by sharing the challenge which I had as a Christian being asked to establish a new university in an Islamic country. Obviously, respecting our stakeholders, two of which were the ruler and the deputy ruler in Dubai, we had to show sensitivity uh, to the Islamic tradition. But being a Christian, I realize that the most effective management technique is one of love, Christian love put into practice. When, as a new group of staff, not all of whom were Christian, in fact, very few, the majority were Islamic. When we were talking about the values that the university would have, the one value around which we were all able to focus was the value of caring. Now, caring, which could be translated as an aspect of love, is not something that is soft and cotton wool, but something which is deep and concerning. If we care that our students do well, we are going to make sure that what we do for them is as good as it can be. If I, as the Vice Chancellor of that university, want to make sure that my staff are working as well as they can, and care for them. That means paying attention to the things that will make them more effective. And it means doing it as a personal example, as well as doing it generally. And for a ridiculous but true and sincere example, one member of my staff broke her leg skiing she had a choice. She could have spent three months at home for the leg to mend, or she could have been on her own in Dubai with the support of friends. I could not swim at the time, but a group of staff took it in turns to get into the swimming pool so that she could do her exercises and work with us. And that I give as just a small example of what that value of care means in, in practice. And what, of course, happened was that it infected the community. And that meant that some of the more difficult strategic stuff was possible because there was a commitment to it through that value of caring. une question peut-être très générale mais il nous, me semble comme nouveau recteur que l'un des points clés euh, c'est le recrutement notamment des professeurs et des responsables d'instituts à l'intérieur d'une université catholique qu'est-ce que et ces responsables suivant les pays euh, peuvent être peut-être personnellement proche des valeurs chrétiennes sans que leur foi chrétienne ne soit développée. Est-ce qu'on peut tracer quelques critères pour ce recrutement 
qui sera différent pour une université catholique d'une université publique, tout en demandant des compétences euh, au moins identiques sur les questions euh, d'enseignement et de recherche. I mentioned uh, in the early part of my talk about complexities of working with different states. And in the UK at the moment, the employment legislation is such that it is impossible or almost impossible um, to have any regard to a person's faith when making an employment decision, even though it may be a faith-based organization. And because of the opportunities that exist for unsuccessful candidates to challenge appointing decisions on the grounds of gender or race or a number of other things, decisions particularly at senior levels need to be made with the utmost care. The way which I found of getting close to the information that you would be seeking without offending the national law was to ask a question about integrity. I will take you through the sequence. It is very short, but it has always helped me to identify people. I ask what candidates understand by the term integrity. Their answer gives me a, one level of understanding as to whether they appreciate what it really is. I then ask whether they believe that they have integrity. And of course, everybody says yes. And I then ask what is the killer question? What do they believe is the source of their integrity? Now, by going down that line of questioning, I am not asking anybody for their faith or I'm not, I believe, contravening the law in the UK. But it gives people for whom their faith is important the opportunity to say that in an environment where they know they are not going to be discriminated against for it. I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's as helpful as, as I can be on that question. Um, but for senior appointments, I would always advise spending time with a person and really understanding whether the, the chemistry between you, the values between you are such that are going to help your university. Estamos en el tiempo ya para salir de acá. Quiero agradecer al profesor y creo que hemos quedado con una alta motivación después de escuchar su exposición. Muchas gracias, profesor. Agradecemos a participação de todos e lembramos que amanhã realizaremos o último dia da 24ª Assembleia Geral da Fiuk com a síntese dos resultados administrativos e financeiros seguida das eleições. Desejamos a todos uma boa tarde. Good, af Good afternoon. I just would like to have before we before leaving I would like to uh, bring uh, two uh, information. Going back to the, to the survey on the uh, culture of the students in Catholic universities, I would like to inform 
that because some people were asking questions about that. I would like to inform you that there would be various levels of publications of the results of the survey. First, the results will be available to every single university that has participated, of course, to, together with the students, to the survey. First point. Second point, there will be also a regional publication where the results, we would try to give a picture of the results in a very specific region. And third, there will be also a global publication. Of course, it is not technically a comparative study, but anyway, comparisons are possible. So there will be also a global, comp a, a global publication. So the, it will be a series, I think, that should uh, be interesting for all our universities. And even other bodies, not even Catholic bodies, already ask about the results. So they are very anxious to have the results. I'm not promising that the results will come out in 2012, but we hopefully, we would like to have the, the results uh, sometimes in 2013. So this is for the first point. And the second point tonight, uh, we have the, the an invitation. It is the, the dinner of the president of IFCU, Dr. Sanera, will be presiding the dinner. And uh, I take my, I grab, I grab this opportunity to inform that will, it, it, it is a, a formal dinner. Thank you and good afternoon.